it's going to be very interesting to see ultimately what surfaces and and what survives you know the this <laughs> ultimate test of whether the technology can be feasible at scale because otherwise if we uh you know just pour money into any grand idea but it's not scalable and it's not measurable then it just won't do any good because it'll be like trying to uh you know uh, empty the ocean with a spoon welcome to 20 minute leaders just sit back relax and learn from the leaders of today it's a journey each one is different unique inspiring let's get started 20 minute leaders is a proud supporter of make a wish israel and tech to peace and is in proud collaboration with secret cord ventures J Ventures, Riverside FM, Fusion VC, Birthright Excel, J Impact, Leap, Google for Startups, and Hippo, and in media partnership with C-Tech. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Today I'm with Ruth Dagan, partner and head of the environment and climate change practice at Herzog Law Firm. She recently has been appointed as an advisor to the United Nations Climate Change Convention Secretariat on Carbon Markets. and has been leading environmental and climate law practitioner in Tel Aviv and New York for over two decades. She holds a doctorate from NYU's School of Law, specializing in environmental finance. Her practice is deeply focused on climate-related technological innovation, development of carbon offsetting projects, and carbon market transactions. She works closely with a multitude of international corporations, tech companies, financial institutions, and investors, To develop curated carbon strategies tailored to their unique needs and targets. She's a firm believer in markets and is involved in both national and international forums developing carbon market tools and policies. Really appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy you are. The work that you're doing uh, is uh, taken very seriously now uh, as the world is gearing up very seriously. Uh, obviously cop 27 just happened recently and we have a uh, quite a bit of you know energy surrounding energy and uh, and carbon emissions and and the whole industry is you know really putting its um uh, it's it's not only at the you know our, our energy and our thoughts but also our resources into trying to understand what are the really the best ways for us to to tackle a lot of these emerging issues and so I'm really happy to have you here and talk a little bit about your own you know your own energy passion for for the ecosystem that we're in your own well your own position within the ecosystem and a little bit about your story so again thank you for being here tell me a little bit about you know what you really care about what is it that you really care about wow okay so actually um i i think that um the the path that i've taken i probably it, it's taken several decades to get to this point but uh Uh, probably somehow in the back of my mind I knew from uh, inception that this is what was meant to be and I somehow inexplicably was uh, uh, very attracted to uh, this content matter and uh, anything related to uh, environment and uh, environmental science and uh, climate science ultimately. And since unfortunately I, I thought I don't have the appropriate skills to be a scientist, I chose to be a lawyer. Um, Just- then I, I decided to connect these two fields together and do what I can in uh, <laughs> the field of law and policy and regulation to put forward the important causes within environment and climate change. So that's ultimately what actually led me to where I am today. All right, that, that's, that's really cool. And so how does that day look like? You know, what you do in the day-to-day, what is that actually taking place with? Okay, wow. Well, so um, I actually have, uh, you know, a very, very diversified workload and a typical day would probably include working on various transactions It can be M a transactions or investment uh, deals within companies that are in the environment and climate tech space. okay so that's something that's really uh, taking off lately and a lot of uh, VC funds and and uh, 
uh, just uh, major international corporations are looking into investing in innovative technologies in the climate tech space. This is a very broad uh, uh, ecosystem and many, many uh, technology companies can actually uh, connect to the uh, climate narrative and, and provide various solutions, uh, whether they be an actual reduction or elimination of uh, greenhouse gas emissions or any type of technology that would be able to monitor and uh, verify reductions and uh, um, solutions to these emissions. And uh, any type of technologies that are actually even collect connected to blockchain uh, that can uh, look at the chain of, of uh, reductions and, and how they are transferred from corporation to corporation and uh, keep track of those reductions. So this is a, a, a very diversified field today that everybody is looking into. And that's something that we actually work on with our clients, both um, representing the tech companies themselves and investors. So that's one uh, aspect of what I do in a day. I also work a lot on regulatory aspects. Um, so, so we work a lot with corporations and financial institutions that are looking at uh, trends, major trends within the climate space today. There are not literally, it's like a moving target that uh, uh, every single day, sometimes several times a day, you see some sort of uh, regulatory initiative coming out. Uh, many times it's out of the European Union and it actually affects the entire globe. It's like a ripple effect that comes out of Europe and they're saying, okay, we expect these and these types of standards that uh, the uh, corporations need to adhere to, and this is what expect this is what is expected from now on. And uh, these regulatory trends really affect how corporations behave and what type of uh, tech investments they would look to in order to find solutions to their pain, their climate pain. Um, so that's another aspect. And for me, like, uh, I, I, I guess the, uh, ultimate, uh, cherry on top would be, uh, the work that I do within the carbon markets. And that's working a lot on deals that, uh, their essence is to commercialize, uh, the commodity that is the reduction of, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, uh, work on projects that allow for offsetting. And and essentially what happens there in uh, carbon markets is that um, this is basically a lever, uh, um, a tool to finance uh, projects that allow decarbonization of the economy. And um, these deals that are just uh, accelerating and happening basically all over the world now are soon expected to become a part of uh, an international emissions trading system that would be supervised by the European Union. So this is um, another major thing that we actually do, uh, my team and myself, on a daily basis, and it's really fascinating. Now, balancing, uh, you know, obviously, you know, the, the two backgrounds sounds Really, really cool. I'm, I'm curious yeah. as we're, yeah. you know, understanding that this is a concern, not, um, not just, you know, economically, you know, financially, this is a, a worldwide, you know, um, challenge that we're all, that we all need to tackle. What is the role of organizations that are not climate tech, right? You have, you know, so many companies, most companies are not labeling themselves as climate tech. Yes. And I'm curious as to how. How do these organizations should, how should they, in your opinion, react to everything that's happening now? Do they need to react? Is there something that they can react with? Yes, absolutely. So um, they have a role, they have a significant role to play in this uh, transition economy that essentially is going to be moving from the situation that we're in right now, which is, uh, a carbon intense economy 
to a net zero carbon economy. And that is something that's going to be happening over the course of the next uh, one to two decades. It's a very slow process, but we're there already. We're within this transition period. And all corporations or all human activity has a role to play uh, within this transition. So definitely uh, companies that don't see themselves as being the solution need to find um, a way to adopt uh, and internalize these external solutions into their own processes and activities. And that's their role in section. Got it. Okay. And so are things changing industry-wide to allow for new incentives to come into place for these companies or for these leaders? What, what do CEOs of companies do you know in relation to these emerging changes that we have yeah so so they have a variety yeah. of uh, courses of action that they can adopt in this context and uh first of all obviously you cannot ignore uh regulation okay so there are very clear regulatory signals that are being sent to the economy and to the uh corporations in all sectors across economy uh, generally just stating a very clear message, listen, uh, um, carbon emissions are no longer legitimate. Everyone needs to act to reduce them and to eliminate them ultimately. So the regulatory um, signals, they are being sent in a very, I would say, sophisticated way because the, the main actors who are now um, under this regulation are actually the financial ones okay so so basically what the regulator is saying i am going to press hard where the money is and once the financial actors are under this regulation and they are required to address their climate risk the risk that is inherently uh internal to the funds that they provide, the loans that they provide, the investments that they make. Um, once we do that, that will ultimately spill over into the real corporations that have actual operations on the ground, which ultimately cause the emissions. So that's the major and heaviest regulatory trend, the financial one. And then, of course, we're seeing gradually more and more of regulation that is direct to reduce emissions. In addition to that, there is an entire universe of uh, economic incentives and a lot of money to, yeah. is really being thrown at uh, corporations that uh, need to somehow uh, finance and do a lot of uh, R&D work in order to develop processes that are less carbon intense. So they're uh, sort of... Uh, these two worlds that need to work together, both the regulation and the incentives. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the incentives, right? I mean, you know, it almost sounds like there's the sort of, there's the, you know, why you should, if you do this, you'll win. Or if you do this, you'll, you know, you, yeah. you want to avoid losing, right? To uh, sort of, uh, um, a, an, an interesting balance. I'm, 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 cu I'm, very, I'm always curious about the, you know, both pieces, but I'm particularly curious about healthy economic incentives that guide, you know, individuals to make decisions that are in their favor. You know, it's a win-win. Tell me a little bit about how we, what we've learned in your eyes about the successful economic incentives of doing something that is not trivial as an industry. Okay, so I, I hope I don't disappoint you, but uh, I actually, I, I have a pretty realistic, if not to say cynical view of economic incentives coming from the government, because it, at least uh, my, my experience here on the ground, uh, they're probably not enough. So the, the challenge of in behavior and economic decisions and choices is so deep and and uh, so significant that these economic incentives alone will not be enough. It's like a drop in the ocean. However, they can be a catalyst. They can help because once 
the government signals that it is behind a certain um, course of action or technology or a certain project that uh, addresses greenhouse gas emissions, that signal alone is completely worth it and, and will allow for additional investments uh, to flow in that specific direction. So sometimes even if they don't, if the, the uh, state doesn't actually write the check, uh, you know, with uh, certain uh, uh, funding flowing into a specific project, the mere fact that they say, okay, we're behind this, th this sounds good to us and we'll work with it and we'll not try to uh, somehow circumvent the project with, uh, you know, uh, piling a lot of bureaucracy and uh, regulatory requirements on it um, uh, that ultimately delay these projects and make them just uh, impractical to implement, then uh, that in itself will really go a long way into uh, moving us forward. Of course, uh, you know, actual funds for, for uh, such projects can always help, but they are not the game changer. The game changer is the signal that the state will send and that will ultimately allow for uh, funds and, and uh, private uh, funding actors to come in and, and give the necessary backing finance wise. Very cool. Where, where are we headed in your eyes? Yep. Where, where are we now uh, at the, right at the beginning of 2023, a lot of, I mean, the, everything is crazy. It sounds like there's so many different things happening. You know, I'm in the generative AI space. And so I've, it's kind of crazy to me how many different industries we have now or different verticals that are just exploding that we're left just thinking, you know, what is happening and what can we get excited about? So what, where, you know, what's exciting from your lens for this upcoming year, months, decade? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I can definitely say that where we're going with this, uh, the, the ultimate climate challenge is the fact that, uh, first of all, there are still many technologies that are really um, not ripe enough for uh, actual implementation. Uh, they're very experiment, uh, experimental, they're very risky, and um, it, it's going to be very interesting to see ultimately what surfaces and, and what survives, you know, the this <laughs> ultimate test of whether the technology can be feasible at scale. Because otherwise, if we, uh, you know, just pour money into any grand idea, but it's not scalable and it's not measurable, then it just won't do any good because it'll be like trying to, uh, you know, uh, empty the ocean with a spoon. You can keep on going, but it's not going to take us anywhere. The magnitude of the changes that, that's required is so enormous that you need technologies that are scalable. That's the key one. Second thing is that um, the reductions that are measured need to be reliable and need to be monitored accurately so that there is trust in the market. Otherwise, there will not be funding of these technologies and projects because no one is going to be able to tell reliably if they do produce the results that they, cl they claim they can produce. So um, anything related to MRV, the worlds of monitoring, reporting, and verification of uh, greenhouse gas uh, reductions, those are the worlds of technology of tomorrow, and, and definitely that's where everybody's going to be looking to. And of course, the uh, uh, probably the expansion of carbon markets and creation of a lot of standards in order to create a uh, reliable activity within carbon markets, which is the ultimate financing tool for uh, decarbonization. So th those are probably the main trends that I would look to in the coming few years. Amazing. And how do you see your, your role uh, change evolve uh, as, as these things evolve, you know, over the, over these years? Yeah. So um, I think that probably one of the main things that I've been fortunate enough to be 
able to do uh, over the course of the past several months is be involved as a consultant to uh, the United Nations to the team that is actually working on uh, the rules and modalities of the international emissions trading system that is slated to become operational within several years. So that's been fascinating work and I am uh, really honored that I, I'm ha I have this opportunity and um, I'm really hoping that you know, this project will come into fruition quickly. It's going to make a global change. And the mere fact that I can be a part of that is, is really thrilling for me. Um, so, so that's something major that's going to be developing. And uh, yeah. also, I think that probably you know, s since I'm really at the center of what's happening uh, within carbon markets in general and, and climate policy, and because it really... Um, it touches upon every aspect of the economy. It's going to be fascinating to see how governments deal with it, how actors within the market deal with it, how the financial sector deals with it. And uh, it, it really touches upon every single aspect of the economy. And we're really seeing an evolutionary process that's fascinating in every possible way, I would say. Phenomenal. Ruth, thank you so much. Best of luck with all the amazing work that you do. I uh, really appreciate your time and your, your energy and uh, continue, we'll continue cheering from the side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. It was a pleasure talking to you.